third day, Esther. On the third day, Esther put on her robo, royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room, opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight, and he held out. Uh, he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even to the half of my kingdom. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. And the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, My wish and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king had said. And Haman went out that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh. And Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, and all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he had advanced him above the officials and the servants of the king. Then Haman said, even Queen Esther let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared, and tomorrow also I am invited by her together with the king. Yet all this is worth nothing to me, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows fifty cubits high be made, and in the morning tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it, then go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. This is the word of God. Good morning, IBC, and uh, thank you very much, Brian, for, for reading. Thank you so much, Anne, for leading in worship, and thank you, Brickta, for also leading us this morning. It's a wonderful opportunity to be with you. Good morning. And we are so grateful, we are so thankful for the church fellowship and in how you have continued to stand behind us. Uh, it was such a blessing, the surprise that you sent us in terms of just the support that we were able to receive from you, uh, even that will help to assist with all the processes of registering for the work that we do. And we are trying to set up a cross-cultural mission training program for those who do not know. And God has been faithful. God has been good. I will reserve a little bit of the time for speaking about the work we do for a later occasion. Today, I really wanted us to just focus on, on the particular text that we have read. Uh, for those who are perhaps visiting us for the first time, we are on a series covering the book of Esther, and there's been already about four sermons that have been spoken by other preachers. And as our sister Brigitte said, these are available on YouTube, and uh, it would be nice to be able to follow that through. But if you are uh, already part of that series and you've been following through, then I just wanna invite us to consider Esther chapter five. It's a unique text and a beautiful text. And therefore, let me pray for, for that particular session that we are about to cover in preaching. Father, thank you this morning for your word. There's nothing in this world like your word. Your word is living, it is active, it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It pierces to the division of the soul and separates the joints from the marrow. How I pray this morning that you will help your word become alive. That the very thing that you have purposed for us to be able to hear, understand, consider, and receive, we would receive. Would you now, Lord, meet every need that is available, that our hearts are not distracted to anything 
outside of the context of the church and outside of the context of considering your word. And as we see you bless this word, as we receive it, we'll be careful to give you thanks. Holy Spirit, do have your way this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The world in which we are living in right now is a perilous world. In honesty, uh, there is a tremendous attack towards the church to the degree that it is even a life-threatening situation for the people of God. When you just consider where the world is and its antagonism towards the church, it's no question that we live in challenging times. Our brother uh, and pastor, uh, okay, last uh, week or the week before that, when they were considering the chapter four, he had mentioned some of these areas where the church is under attack. The question of persecution for the church is a real question. Thousands, if not millions of believers are persecuted today, and you can only but go to such institutions such as Open Doors, which cover that, and you will see the staggering statistics. There's an attack into the two institutions that God has put into the body of the church, and that is the institution of marriage and family. A lot of marriages right now are under a threat. Some are on the verge of divorce. And this is a situation that is outside the church, but is as well inside the church. You might even this morning know of a family that is staggering in their marriage, that is facing a life-threatening situation to their marriage. Perhaps it's even your own marriage at this point. Families being broken. And there's a concerted effort by our enemy towards this institution and towards the people of God. Then there's a the whole question of truth and the attack towards truth. And truth at this point is being considered relative. It's not objective. We know that very clearly. Long gone are the days when you as a Christian would be able to be in your position where God has placed you, be it in your work, be it in your school, be it in your neighborhood, and confidently point out that you are Christian and are holding to the truth. Nowadays, if you speak up that you are Christian, you are the minority, and you will quickly be the object of antagonism. Truth is in decay. We see the church being bombarded by outside forces, such as the whole movement of LGBT. It's not only targeting the church, the adults, it is targeting our young people as well. The whole influence of social media and the impact that it has to our young people, these are all situations and there perhaps there are many more that I cannot be, be able to mention this morning that are life threatening to the people of God. These are life threatening to maybe someone you know very, very well, but as well, perhaps even to you yourself as a child of God. And the question this morning that I hope and pray that we can wrestle with is how do we respond as the children of God? How do we respond as a people of God? I believe the story of Esther and particularly the chapter five that we have read gives us a very unique and exemplary example of how we as a people of God should respond to these life-threatening situations. Esther gives us valuable lessons that we need to learn and that we can apply in our situations, wherever we are placed by God. But one of the things that God has privileged the church is this 
whole aspect of intercession, being able to stand in the gap. As we will see this morning, Esther does a great thing. One, she uniquely and wisely and insightfully prepares to go before the king. Second, Esther not only prepares, but takes the bold step of faith in going before the king. And thirdly, she patiently waits. So I want to invite us to, to consider Esther this morning. And there's a PowerPoint here that I want us to follow. And so I will share that with you, even as we follow it this morning. And I want to look at these key lessons. And as I've said, there are three key lessons. And then there's the aspect in which Christ is a better intercessor or mediator. And then we will consider how then do we apply this? What are the implications for our lives? But look how this is played out. And what is it that Esther will teach us this morning with regard to just this whole aspect of the privilege we have to intercede, to stand in the gap in times that are perilous for the people of God, the times such as in which we are living. Esther's wise and insightful preparation. Now, you know, as you have already covered in this story, that the people of God were under tremendous threat. Haman, who was the right-hand man of the king, had developed a unique antagonism towards the Jews. And particularly that was being sparked by the fact that Mordecai was an antagonist towards him. Haman wanted the people of God to be extinct, gotten rid of. He had made a plot to annihilate these people. And actually the verdict had already been signed and the king had already given the permission for this. The question was who then was capable of going before the God to intercede on behalf of the people of God. And we know as you read the end of chapter four that indeed Mordecai approaches Esther who was now the queen and in a favored position with regard to being able to approach the king. And the interlogue that they have between one another helps us to understand why preparation was so essential for Esther. Even as Mordecai comes to Esther to remind him that he, she needs to be the one to step up and go towards the king, Esther is quick to remind Mordecai. It is not a light matter at this point in history to have gone before King Zasus or Azahurus. Coming before the king was a hefty matter if he had not invited you. It was against the law and a crime that was punishable by death. In addition to that, Esther herself had not been before the king for 30 days. It kind of tells you the magnitude of this problem. Even her beloved queen had not approached this king for 30 days. If you add into addition the fact that Esther knew that this king was a moody king, he had mood swings. One minute you might be in his favor, the next minute you might be in disfavor. What well, if she approaches this king and suddenly he decides he doesn't want to see Esther? That's her death. How do you prepare for that? Well, Esther wisely prepares. She insightfully prepares for this ordeal because of the nature and the weight of the situation. She prepares herself a hut 
and she ensures that her heart is in the right place. Esther calls for a fast. And we know very well that in scripture, fast is often associated closely with prayer. She calls for her fast and she actually asks the people of God to enter into a three-day fast. Esther was not just herself fasting, but she and her servants were to engage as well in fasting as the people of God were fasting. This was a insightful preparation because she knew that only through God's intervention will this be possible. Only through God's favor and grace would this be a, a situation where he, she can approach the king and it will be favorable for her. But not only does she prepare herself in her heart spiritually for divine intervention, Esther prepares herself emotionally. We, she, we see that Esther is making a resolve at this point. A resolve that she's making is that I will go. And even if it costs my life, let it be. She was willing and was preparing herself for the worst case scenario. But at the same time, she was preparing herself to pay the price. Whatever it cost me to come before this king, I'm willing to pay for it. Esther prepares herself physically. You see, as you begin to read chapter five in verses one, that Esther on the third day put on her royal robes. And then she stood before the king. She adorned herself in such a manner that when the king looks at her, she is physically prepared in appearance. But there's an aspect in which Esther was prepared beyond just coming before the king. Esther was prepared for a favorable request being granted. And she knew that when this request is granted, what is her next move? What would she need to do? And she prepares already ahead for a banquet, anticipating a favorable response from the king. Esther's wise and insightful preparation is the first key. There's a second key here that Esther helps us to understand. And that's the key of Esther's bold faith in coming before the king. Despite this wise preparation, Esther still needed to take the steps of faith in coming before the king, All right? No matter how much she prepares, if she doesn't come before the king, what are, would be the chances of that request even being granted? And thus faith without actions is dead, as the book of James reminds us. Not only did this situation require a wise, insightful preparation, but this situation required a bold step in coming before the king, even without knowing the outcome. And yet you see Esther's faith continue to grow in this. Not only does she have the faith to prepare, but now she has the boldness, the faith to come before this king, knowing very well what it means for her. I believe very strongly that her faith must have been first and foremost in God. She was convinced of God's covenant promises to his people. The same God who had promised Abraham that he will be with him. The same God who had told Abraham that I will bless you and I will mess with anybody who chooses to mess with you. Esther was convinced of the God's God covenant promises that he had made to his people. The same promises that God had made to the people of God, reminding them that he will be with them. And there is no situation, no peril that will ever wipe out the people of God because God is with them. 
God reminded Moses, God reminded Joshua, I am with you. And as Esther was confident that even in coming before the king, the situation was not in Haman's hand. The situation was not in King Zestus' hand. This situation was in God's hand. Yet she takes a step of faith in coming. But there's a third instance in which we can learn from Esther. Not only does she wisely and insightfully prepares, not only does Esther take a bold step in coming before the king in verses one all the way to three, and we see that as even as she comes, she is given the favor and extended the scepter by the king. But thirdly, Esther was patient in waiting for the right opportunity and intervention for her mediation request. You see this very clearly play out in verses four all the way to eight, perhaps. I just want to read it again so that we can hear it. After being received by the king, the king makes this request to Esther. What is it that Queen Esther you want? Even up to half my kingdom shall be granted to you. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to have my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Esther answered, my wish and my request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it is pleasing to the king to grant my wish and to fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king says. And we may, we may look at this situation and ask, but why, why this constant delay? What was, the, what was at the back of Esther's mind in this delay? Well, scripture doesn't tell us. Esther doesn't reveal to us what was happening behind her thinking. And thus we may be left to speculation. But I think biblically, scripture will inform us. I, I strongly believe that Esther understood the importance of patience in making this request. She would need time to allow the king to see a different side of Haman. Remember, Haman was the second right-hand man to the king. Any quick accusations targeting Haman may provoke a situation of treason and contempt to somebody who the king had valued. Esther needed to allow time so that the true nature of Haman comes forward. Secondly, I think it was an opportunity for Esther to extend grace, grace even to an enemy. Romans chapter 12 verses 9 to 14 reminds us not to take the situation in our hands, but to leave vengeance to God and to do good to those who do us wrong, to be genuine in our love for others, to persevere in hardship as we do good to them, because we know ultimately God is in control. But I think perhaps Lee, there's a third reason here why Esther extends patience in waiting for the right opportunity. I believe that perhaps she was being divinely guided by God. 
so that she allows the purposes of the Lord to be accomplished. Remember Proverbs chapter 16 verses 1 tells us, and allow me to read that for you because it's an important text here for you to understand this. Proverbs chapter 16 verses 1 tells us, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Proverbs chapter 19 verses 21 tells us this, many are the plans in the mind of a man but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Esther may have been speaking, but God may have been directing the scenario and the circumstances providentially so that the purposes of God are accomplished. And thus she points out even in both occasions, you've been given a request by a king who is not very patient. And twice you tell the king, ah, just wait a minute. Just slow down. You come, let's have a meal together. I think the whole process of slowing things down also gives room for the events that would follow. Because when you read from verses 9 of chapter 5, where we're looking at onwards, you see the true nature of Haman beginning to grow. His antagonism towards Mordecai actually will set him up so that he himself ends up laying his own trap. Haman became so incensed with this whole scenario that eventually he listens to the wrong counsel. His wife and his friends lead him to set up a gallow. And the gallows itself will be the very instrument through which Haman will be destroyed. But it also sets up chapter 6, allowing for Mordecai to be honored and to be raised up and lifted up by the king. Patience was necessary for waiting for the right opportunity. And yet, even as Esther shows us the uniqueness by which she approaches this whole situation and the power of her intercession on behalf of the people of God at a perilous time, Scripture is very clear that we indeed, in Christ, we have a superior intercessor. Christ has mediated on our behalf. When sin, when Satan, when death threatened our very existence. Christ sacrificially offered himself and became our propitiation with the Father. Out of his work on the cross, we are saved. We are reconciled to a right relationship with God. Notice Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. For this reason, he made, he had to be made like them, fully human, right? And scripture reminds us in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Notice Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And there is the approach in verses 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We have a superior intercessor 
First John chapter 2 verses 1 and, 12, uh, and 2 tells us he is our advocate with the Father. He stands to defend our case against one who accuses us because he is our propitiation. The one who has satisfied the wrath of God fully. And therefore, there's no accusation that the enemy can bring on our behalf that will stand. In Christ Jesus, we have a superior intercessor. We have a superior mediator. We are much more privileged than Esther was. Because of what Christ has done on the cross, because of the work that he has accomplished, we now have a direct access to God. Therefore, beloved, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that was his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw to God with a sincere heart, with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. What a privileged position that we as the people of God, we as the children of God have today. Haman would... Uh, Esther would have come before King Zestus, perhaps trembling in fear, not knowing what would happen. Yet we are privileged to know that we can come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there is no fear that needs to grip our hearts because we have confidence to enter and have direct access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Esther would have come to the king not knowing what the king would have said. And I think it was a delight for her when she heard the king say these words. Esther, what is your request? Whatever it is, even half to my kingdom will be granted to you. That was a gesture of generosity. But can I remind us this morning that in God we have a king who is more gracious and more generous than King Zessus could ever be. Listen to the words of Luke chapter 2, 12, verses 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is God's good pleasure, his gracious will to give you the kingdom. I mean, God is willing to give you the kingdom. Romans 8, verses 32, reminds us that God did not spare his own son, but gave him, us, gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God is one who is desiring and ready to grant any request. Jesus reminded his disciples before he left that if you ask of anything in my name to the Father, I will ensure that it is given to you so that you may show yourselves to be my disciples. What a privileged position we stand in today, brothers and sisters, that we can stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and have direct access and know that anything that we ask, which is in according with his will, not our will, but according to his will, God will be willing to grant. My question to us this morning then is what is the implications for our lives? Even as we stand privileged, even as we stand as those who have this tremendous opportunity to exercise intercession on behalf of the needs that we are sensing are happening. What then is our response? What are the implications for our life? Can I suggest that we learn these three lessons from Esther and we start applying them in our lives? There's a sense in which Esther reminds us of the value of preparation in anticipation becoming in coming before the king, right? You may ask, okay, why now do I need to prepare to come before God? Let me ask you a simple question. I will use a human example so that to emphasize a spiritual example. 
Suppose you were to receive a letter today to come before King Alexander, the king of the Netherlands. Would you come casually? Would you just come just as, or would you actually prepare? Would you not take the question to prepare? Because you're coming before a royalty. Now, if we, from a human perspective, should take precautions in coming before an earthly royalty, how much more when we have to come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who is the ruler and sovereign, the creator of all that there is. And what should our preparation look like? Well, is there a set time that you have set aside that this is the hour, this is a time in which out of my busyness, I will come before the king. I'm very sure if King Alexander would invite you, there would be a set time you would be meeting him. You would not just come to him randomly. The same ought to be true. Part of our preparation ought to be preparing my heart. I've set aside a time in which I intend to meet with my father, in which I intend to meet with the king of kings. I've prepared my heart. And part of the preparation that Esther had was part of the heart preparation. But I've also prepared what I will be requesting from the father. And yet there's a form of preparation that would involve anticipating that God will answer. If God would answer, what would you do? You know, sometimes we come before God and we're not really prepared for an answer. There's a story that is told of a famous scholar and a preacher. Many of you perhaps know him, Donald Guthrie of Scotland. And on one morning occasion when there was a severe drought in that period of time. Dr. Guthrie had in that morning service prayed that God would provide rain. And then they broke the service and went home and uh, he had lunch. And as he was preparing to leave uh, for the afternoon service, his wife, uh, his little daughter, Mary came and handed him an umbrella. And he looked at his daughter and asked, uh, why do we need this? And the daughter reminded him, but you prayed for rain this morning. Don't you expect God will send it? And Dr. Guthrie was gently, <laughs> but humbly reminded. And so they took the umbrella and went to the service. And when they came back home, they were glad that they could take shelter under that umbrella in the drenching, pouring storm. That story can easily remind us. You know, sometimes we come before God and we ask for God, do this. God, change this. But we're really not anticipating that he will answer. And thus we don't prepare. Esther shows us very clearly that she was prepared. She prepared a meal ahead of time, such that when King Xerxes responded and said, what should we grant you? She said, all I want is that you come, come. Let me ask you a question this morning. How prepared are you when you're coming before God? And how much of your heart anticipates the answer? Esther reminds us that it not only takes preparation, but there's a boldness that we need to have when we are coming before the king. Because of the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. 
It's one thing to prepare for it, but we need to take the step of faith in coming before God. And it may be something that might cost us something. It may inconvenience you at a certain degree. It may mean that you have to wake up perhaps when the rest of the house is asleep. It may mean that you have to get out of the office and avoid having lunch so that you may meet with the king. But coming is just as important as preparing. And thirdly, Esther reminds us of the patience in waiting for God's perfect answer and timing. One of the things that is unique in this whole story is just that patience that Esther exercises. She was not quick to respond with, give me A, B, C, D, right? And unfortunately to say, if I can give you two pictures, I believe some of us approach, approach the throne of grace, approach the time with God. In the same manner, we approach perhaps the toilet. We go there with a specific need and we stay there as long as we can just give out and relieve ourselves of that need and we're out and gone. And that is not the picture that Esther is showing us. Rather, think of the picture of how does it look like when two, a couple go out for a candlelight dinner? They're just there to spend time with one another. They're just there to enjoy the company of one another. They're there to fellowship, even over a meal. And that fellowship precedes any requests being asked or granted. And perhaps it is time when us as believers need to take that approach in coming before the Father. We need to stop treating God as an ATM machine where you go and insert your card and you get what you want and you're finished with that. Rather, we need to love to be in the presence of God. Listen to what David in Psalm 27 verses 4 says. David reminds us of this joyous privilege. And he says in, in Psalm chapter 27, verses 4, One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David was more concerned with fellowshipping with God. The beauty of intercession is fellowshipping with God. The power is in fellowshipping with God, spending time in his presence, quietly listening and receiving from him, waiting for the right opportunity. But patiently waiting also involves patiently waiting. Daniel chapter 10 reminds us that Daniel, he prayed and asked of God. And immediately Daniel bowed down to pray. An answer was sent from heaven. But it took him 21 days to receive that answer. So suppose Daniel was somebody who was quick to give up. Would he not have quickly concluded God doesn't hear, God doesn't answer. This is not a request God will give and move on. But no, Daniel did not long despair, but was very patient in waiting. And how is it for us? Are we patient in knocking? Scripture reminds us that ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be answered. There's a sense in which Jesus was reminding his disciples that patience sometimes is necessary 
as you wait for God's perfect timing, because God does things in the fullness of time. And sometimes his timing may be different from our own timing. We need to be people who are patient in waiting before God. What is God calling you to change in your intercession or mediation or standing in the gap? In which area is God asking you as his child who is privileged and can access him that you actually need to work on? Are you someone who has set aside time and is well prepared when they anticipate coming before the Lord? Do you approach it with a sense of persuasion that you know that God will meet your request? Because he is a good God and a gracious God and a generous God? Are you someone who is patient when you're waiting upon God that you will stay the cause and keep praying until something happens? God has divinely appointed prayer and intercession as the means by which he will bring upon change and accomplish his purposes on the world. I know he can do it without us, but he has divinely and uniquely appointed the avenue of our praying and him answering as the way by which God wants to bring change in life-threatening situations. What situation do you know of this morning that you need to take the right step, the bold step to prepare and to come before the king and to wait until he grants you the answer for? May we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what we need to do. And may he empower us in the needed area. May God help us to be the people that we need to be. Because if there's an area in which the church is really struggling, is the area of prayer. And that's why the church is, in a sense, incapacitated from being able to influence society. We have lost sight of the privileged position that we have to intercede. My prayer this morning is that as you walk out of there, God will impact your heart in such a way that you will resolve and you will say, I will take the position that I need to take, no matter the cost. And I will believe you, God, for that which you're putting in my heart to trust you for. And I will wait for the answer. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, would you do that which you alone can do? Awaken us. Awaken us to take our position, to be the intercessors that we need to be, as Esther was the intercessor, appointed for a time such as the one she was living in. Lord, you have appointed us for the time in which we live. This is the season that you have called us to. Would you help us? Or would you empower us? And would you change our perception of how we need to come before you and how we need to trust you and how we need to believe you for the very things that you want to make different? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Paul, for the encouragement. It's really true. The patience to wait for God's perfect time. Uh, shall we sing the song, Jesus Shall Take the Highest Honor? Shall we stand up and shall we sing this song?
Jesus shall take the highest honor. Jesus shall take the highest praise.